Has Britain gone topsy-turvy or is it just in a state of political flux? Immigration, Brexiting, terrorism, zero-hour contracts, housing policy, US-UK foreign relations, left-wing economic populism, right-wing social populism, bedroom taxes, hard Muslim ethnic tensions, a potentially second Scottish independence referendum, the National Health Service, taxing the rich, hung parliaments, majority governments and coalitions, Theresa May's ghostly hair and face, Jamie Corbyn's fetishism with student voters, Donald Trump's hatred for Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor, so many issues to go around and so little time, so much aggro, it's enough to make you want to drink yourself to death with carving lagers and sleep in your own piss. Mr. Speaker, it's fair to say that with the rise of conservative anti-immigrant politics as a result of the credit crunch of 2008 and the strong wave of terror attacks throughout Europe, especially the horrific attack in Manchester and the two attacks in London, one would assume greater gains for UK the Tories. But that did not prove to be true. As of the 10th of June, the Tories lost a majority of eight seats, 318 instead of 326, and UKIP garnered no seats in Parliament. It's fair to say that in the case of UKIP, their aim was already achieved with the Brexit referendum, where nearly 52% voted to leave the European Union. With the majority of UKIP voters being ex Tories, they went back to lend their support to the party. To avoid any gridlock between the other left-wing coalition groups like the Greens, Liberal Democrats and the regional parties in Scotland and Wales, like Plaid Cymru and the DUP. We are going across to have conversations with Theresa May uh, in and around how we can support the national interests essentially and how we can... Just recently the DUP has tried to make a pact along with the Tories after the Tories lost some seats. That is still open to debate whether their ties with English southern politics will work. The loss proved to be a major blow nonetheless. A party so unpopular in the UK, Great Britain and England or whatever you want to call it Two of May's aides resigned and many newspapers were calling for her resignation. These manoeuvres have proven to cast a light that May herself is no Margaret Thatcher, but a spineless cow to some. But enough left-wing banter, let's move on. National interest. When it comes to the first the issue, is most important to Brits was in here three letters repeated all the time on telly. N. H. S. Regardless of your affiliation, the NHS likely remains a very important issue for you and someone you know that may think is a vital service for Brits alike that should be maintained or garner increased funding. Anyways, moving on. There's a reason for this as prior to the 1948, it was under constant terror from the Nazis during the Second World War because medical treatment was very expensive and um, kept towards the aristocratic and the monarchic uh, forms of hierarchy, a new pseudo-socialist government emerged around the time and helped launch the most celebrated healthcare system in the country. Despite accusations of poor nurses on visas working their subpar treatment, cuts to the service and waiting times, so British public still beat their heart over it, despite not being as great as the Swedish or Swiss system. The political debate on immigration is never far from the headlines. Just the second like issue Brits take seriously is the issue of immigration, which is something that still remains divided along party lines. A recent issue manifesting itself a great deal around the 1960s, 1970s, and then making a huge comeback in the past eight years, left-wingers believe more immigration is better to provide diversity and inclusion, while right-wingers believe tighter restrictions or no entry to preserve traditional values. With the rise of Islamic extremism and the extreme competition in jobs and housing monster working class, the debate rages on, as does the pub banter among Steve's and good honest men that one group is taking your jobs, raping your woman, or getting on the door while an other house is quicker than themselves. The jealousy and conflicts that ensue and the conflicting paperwork administered by Immigration Enforcement and Border Patrol lead to a nation of confusion. 
Now, in a country as multicultural as Britain, with its South Asian, African and Caribbean minorities, ethnic cleansing and genocide will be hard work. But containing and pre-vetting particularly Arabs and Muslims and Poles are the Brits' most utmost priority. The Arab Muslim issue is not preserved only for the UK. It is a global phenomenon that is affecting countries like France, Germany, Italy and Sweden. But for some reason, not Ireland or Canada. Maybe the OECD will have to check the matter. I don't think. Shocking uh, to think that somebody's got that much hatred from somewhere. But now I Perhaps the third greatest issue remains Brexit itself. And by the 19th of June, Theresa May and the European Union will go through talks calculating the fate of Britain with uh, and, and or without no Europe, for no better or worse, better leaving or remaining. The Brexit decision, if it is a yes decision among the European Court and May herself, will become official sometime in 2019, and Britain will be declared sovereign outside the EU's supernatural influence. If 52% that voted to leave, many will be happy if there's a possibility this could backfire. May's Tories lost several seats in Parliament and increasing Labour, Green and SNP constituencies have mixed to negative views for more supporters of the Remain camp. Corbyn declared several times years ago that the EU is a corporatist machine whose aim is at exporting and importing cheap labour for unfettered commerce which very much contradicts what he said about Brexit a year ago. When you consider Brexit's leave majority was predominantly working class. Nothing has changed. And many of Nothing the areas voting changed. for that decision were Labour strongholds turned UKIP for some time. This presents some challenges of principle, but that is up to additional debate, something that I can't cover during this video. Among other issues, social housing and bedroom and dementia taxes are often the talk of the corner. The price of housing remains too expensive for young graduates and start-up families, and the imposition of certain taxes have been controversially debated as being damaging to the poor. More than 70% have had to cut back on essential household bills, including gas, water and electricity, to make ends meet. And just less than half of those surveyed have resorted to risky loan systems. To get when it comes to the subject of similarities by country, Similarities between the British and American elections are hard to decipher, but it's fair to say that a worldwide disgust regarding President Donald Trump's political tactics has emerged rapidly through social media and TV punditry after his inauguration. The Russian election hacking conspiracy, with his withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, and his controversial views about the Muslim travel ban may have been points for discontented voters that maybe Brits were not entirely ready for someone that over the top, even if a fair share had trust in Trump's UK equivalent, Nigel Farage. While Britain and America may speak both English, they do have slightly, and I mean slightly, different concerns at stake. The major difference is Brits to be more appreciated of the NHS, which while Americans may regard as socialized medicine, dirk -a dirk -a dirk. Even if the Paris Agreement were implemented in full with total compliance from all nations, it is estimated it would only produce a two tenths of one degree. Now, if we can compare the elections that have occurred in 2017, countries like France. France itself has shown many similarities with their concerns over immigration, the lack of opportunities in working class or industrial areas, and youth unemployment. The US shares those issues too, but the main difference is that France carries a somewhat stronger system of social programs, kind of similar to Britain, but France does have it a lot better than the other two. And issues like homelessness and student loans seem to be less relevant than the both countries. With the French elections in mind, corporate centre-lefty Monroe Macron 
Hun Marsh, a minority faction, won over the anti-immigrant right-wing socialist Marine Le Pen. I hope that surprised many, given the wave of anti-immigrant nationalism occurring throughout Europe. The only result that came out of Trump's effect was that Le Pen's Front National Party held the highest share of votes for the party itself in French electoral history. Sa chère la guerre, moi ma famille elle l'a connu. Je ne veux pas du nationalisme que vous portez. Le projet que vous portez, ça il fallait que vous le placiez, c'était pas facile. Vous avez, alors vous êtes passé par des biais un peu différents là. Vous pouvez rigoler. Moi je rigole pas avec ça. Non parce que je savais que vous alliez me le placer. Non mais je rigole pas avec ça. On a lesser note, the Netherlands had an election featuring anti-immigrant favorite Jaap Wilders from Partij voor de Vrijheid, but lost yet again, as did Austria's anti-immigrant Norbert Hofer, lost through his Freedom Party. Austria, funny enough, voted for a Green Party member instead, a first for the country and for the continent. In regards to left-wing politics, Austria, Britain, France and Netherlands have not seen much success, only for the increase in seats that Britain gained for Jeremy Corbyn's Labour. On Marshes Macron does not count as he is viewed as a corporate shill, and the Netherlands veered to the war of the centre. And what they would consider the centre is certainly more progressive than what America or even Britain for that matter is offering. Canada remains the largest country embracing the progressive charge, or so they say, with Justin Trudeau's Liberals, and there's a possibility of a queer, half-Indian Prime Minister named Leo Varadkar, who would leave the Republic of Ireland to charge a fan girl. ...may start to crumble once the stress of the job starts to take its toll. Still, one point for Canada for giving the political world this fine specimen of leadership. ...of debates ranging on from issue to issue, from constituency to constituency, it is hard to say where Britain may lead, as the years go on. Every matter changes as a result of the public's needs and wants, something that governments and corporations included, cannot accommodate at every turn. ...and explain all in the reversal of the Prime Minister's politics. So I won't take any lessons for the First Minister, because actually, sit down. message to anyone who's planning on carrying out another attack. I've lived in London on and off for 15 years. I can tell you firsthand, this shit never works. It never works. London has seen attack after attack after attack, each with the aim of driving us further apart. And you know what happens? Londoners just band together. You know what happened yesterday? Strangers talked to each other on the tube. They smiled at police officers. They were actually kinder to Muslims. You're achieving the opposite of what you want. Everything counts in large amounts. Thank you. 